participants. So we'll get started. Thank you, first of all, everyone who has joined us on this Friday evening, taking the time out from your busy schedules. We are very glad to have you with us in our webinar number 16. As you might have seen just now in the poster, we started our GF Ideas India webinar series uh, back in February, and we've had uh, 15 sessions till now on different topics uh, regarding the smart protein or the alternative protein sector. And this is our 16th webinar and the topic is harnessing fermentation to feed the world with sustainable alternative proteins. Um, today we have Dr. Liz Specht with us and uh, Liz comes with a lot of experience and is currently leading a lot of this work for fermentation uh, at GFI and she is the Associate Director of Science and Technology at the Good Food Institute. Uh, she comes with a background uh, in, uh, you know, and she currently leading plant-based and cell-based meat innovation, uh, forecast future growth bottlenecks and catalyzes research to proactively address these needs and bottlenecks for Good Food Institute. Uh, she also supports startups and established industry leaders who are moving uh, the field forward. Liz has a bachelor's degree in chemical and biomolecular engineering from John Hopkins University and a doctorate in biological sciences from the University of California, San Diego. And she has postdoctoral research experience from University of Colorado, Boulder. Uh, Liz is a community fellow at CU Boulder Sustainability Innovation Lab and a guest lecturer for Singularity University as well. She has a decade of academic research experience in synthetic biology, recombinant protein expression, and development of genetic tools. She is a firm believer in the power of technology to enable us to meet growing food demands in a sustainable way. Uh, and obviously, we have Varun Deshpande, who is the managing director at the Good Food Institute India. And uh, you know, he, Varun will be starting the webinar by giving in some context and covering uh, an overview of what we are going to uh, look at today in this session. And then Liz is going to present her deck. And at the end, we are going to have a small Q and A session for about thirty minutes. So I would request everyone to you know put in their questions through the Q and A section as and when they come. Uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us. And just to tell you a little bit more about the GF Ideas India community, uh, we are basically building a ecosystem for smart protein innovators, whether you're a researcher, an investor, an entrepreneur, a professional working in the food industry or you know biotech industry, as long as you have demonstrated skills or willingness to you know contribute to the alternative protein or the smart protein sector in India, you should be part of this community. And if you want to join this community, please write to India at JFI.org and you can get access to a bunch of resources that we have created over the past three years for this community. Uh, Varun, would you like to continue? Yes, thank you so much, Ardul, and thank you, Liz, for joining us um, at 6, 10 a.m. Uh, in California while the wildfires are going there. So thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone in the audience as well. We're extremely excited about this topic today. Uh, I think a lot of people have been writing into us about uh, fermentation as, as the third pillar of alternative proteins and their potential, particularly in, and its potential, particularly in emerging markets. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. I'm going to set the stage a little bit for uh, Liz's presentation, which will go into the technical aspects of fermentation and the opportunities therein. Uh, so I'm just going to present my screen here just to get started. All right, you can see this, right, Chardul? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to get started, as I said, with an explanation of um, the context in emerging markets for what we're talking about. Uh, as you know, uh, the Good Food Institute globally uh, is a network of nonprofits that focuses on advancing the science, uh, business, and policy of alternative proteins. Um, I know that a lot of you have uh, attended many of these sessions before but I will repeat some of the initial context, which is our major mission is answering the question of how we're going to feed 9.7 billion, nearly 10 billion people by 2050, about a sixth of whom will be in India, about 60% uh, of whom will be in Asia, about 80% of whom will be in Asia plus Africa, through systems which do not negatively impact the planet, exacerbate climate change, biodiversity loss, the loss of scarce natural resources, etc. And we understand, of course, that the system that we currently have is not quite set up to do this efficiently, sustainably, and safely. Um, I'm going to flip this on its head now and talk a little bit about the considerations of emerging markets. Um, we've seen over the last six months during the COVID-19 crisis in India, essentially what have been pandemic refugees. So people who are uh, unable to go to their homes 
uh, unable to travel from the cities back to their villages because it has been extremely difficult to figure out transportation, logistics, supply chain links, etc. This is the world that we're faced with in the 21st century with exacerbating climate change and additional public health crises that are no doubt on the horizon. This is the world we have to reckon with with respect to industrial animal agriculture and the risks that it, that it entrenches in our global food system. So in terms of the, uh, the things that we have to think about that are on the horizon for emerging markets, of course, we do have severe challenges with respect to being able to address vulnerability in our population. And this is a major concern of ours at GFI India and the things that we think about all the time. Additionally, we, when we talk about vulnerable populations, uh, a major component of that vulnerability lies in uh, nutritional status of our population. So if you look at, for example, iron deficiency anemia, neural tube defects, a number of debilitating conditions that affect the health security of our population and impact our ability to, to shape our destiny, we have some of the highest cohort rates in the world in those conditions. We cannot afford to, to build and entrench uh, a food system that exacerbates those, those, th those challenges. Uh, and we really should be laser focused on the idea of, of building in efficiency and reducing public health risk into our food systems. And finally, we know that we have an extremely large farmer family cohort, something like 51% of our of our population and over 50% of our labor force is, is gainfully employed in agriculture. Uh, this is a population that I think we all read about uh, as being severely challenged at this time. We've seen earlier this year as well, uh, perhaps it's hard to recall everything that's happening this year, but just last month we had um, issues with locusts, um, locust swarms that were coming in, uh, the most severe swarms in decades that uh, were also sort of created by the, the cocktail of climate conditions that had existed for some time. So in general, one of the issues that we face with farmer, uh, farmer welfare in places like India is the lack of connection to lucrative, fast growing markets for these crops. So if farmers, for example, have been growing uh, rice and wheat and soy for decades, it's very difficult to get them to move over to indigenous sustainable crops like pulses and millets, unless you're able to connect them to lucrative end markets. And alternative proteins uh, really represent that opportunity for farmers in a way that hasn't been true for decades in many other areas. But none of what I'm talking about is new, of course. Um, I think we've all heard about many of these things and the general population has known about some of these things for decades, the public health risk of industrial animal agriculture, the sustainability implications, uh, as well as the food security implications. But uh, what's been happening over the decades is the demand for meat and therefore the production of meat has gone up over time. And if you look at where that demand and production is stemming from, uh, the projection for the growth in meat demand over the next decade, between 2020 and 2030 as well, uh, is the hottest zone for that growth in demand is going to be uh, India, China, to a certain extent, Latin America, and then beyond 2030, perhaps it'll be in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the reason for this is something that we've known and something that's been building over time, uh, the evidence for which has been building over time. Meat consumption is underpinned by aspiration in many ways. And so if we have large populations that are, that are growing uh, middle class and, and are, are seeking to eat meat, that is going to increase the demand for meat in many of our regions. So how we seek to address this problem, and this is something that's playing out globally in the form of what's known as the alternative protein sector, or what we're calling the smart protein sector, is we seek to make things that people want. We seek to plug that demand to satisfy it in ways that appeal to consumers and to producers on the basis of things that matter to them. Uh, we seek to create um, a preponderance of science, of business activity, and of regulatory frameworks that allow uh, the alternative protein sector to grow. Uh, and what GFI India is focused on is, of course, helping this sector to grow in India and in other developing markets that are like it. On that note, I'm going to hand over to Liz. Um, I, I just want to say one thing before she starts that when we're talking about creating an environment that is conducive for the growth of alternative protein and for solving the problems that I mentioned earlier, we really need all tools. So a question that we get all the time is, why focus on plant-based versus cultivated versus other things? Um, the answer to that is quite simply that meat demand is massive and, and, and food is quite subjective and personal, right? So if we're talking about uh, offering an alternative uh, 
or being able to, to replace an industry that is the meat industry, which is multiple trillions of dollars. We really need all tools and all systems that are going to satisfy that demand. Fermentation is an incredibly exciting third pillar in this space that's going to grow over the next years. And uh, I hand over to Liz to explain some of what's going on here. I'll stop sharing my screen, Liz, so you can take over. Fantastic. Thank you, Varun, for that introduction. And this really could not be a more urgent or more apt time, as Varun mentioned, or Shardul mentioned, I was, I'm uh, in California this morning, um, which is experiencing tremendous wildfires um, due in large part to climate change. So this is um, a, an increasingly urgent topic. Let me share my screen and get back to our slide deck here. And I appreciate all of you spending a Friday evening with me. All right. So as Varun said, I'd like to start by contextualizing uh, fermentation's role within the alternative protein sector. Um, as you know, there's been a lot of activity in the realm of plant-based proteins. This is sort of the, the most obvious category of alternative proteins using protein sources from conventional terrestrial crops and converting those into forms that mimic the sensory experience of meat, egg, and dairy products. Um, standout brands in this category that you may be familiar with um, from the US are things like Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods, um, but quite a lot of activity really globally in the plant-based protein realm, um, and specifically in the realm of meat alternatives, dairy alternatives, and egg alternatives. On the right-hand side here is a, a sort of emerging area of alternative proteins of cultivated meat. So this is the endeavor of growing genuine meat, genuine animal products directly from animal cells. So removing the animal from the equation, but getting essentially the exact same end product. Um, you may again be familiar with some of the activity in this space. There's been a boom of new startups um, at last count over 60 startups, all of which have formed in the last five years. Um, and very rapid pro progress on that front. So that's another category that's gotten quite a bit of attention in the press lately uh, because of that activity. But what I'll talk about today is this middle pillar here, which I think is just recently sort of emerging as a true key third pillar of the alternative protein sector both for its ability to produce novel protein sources as kind of standalone inputs to products, as well as its ability to support the innovations going on in the plant-based protein realm and in cultivated meat. So we'll touch on all of these different modalities of using fermentation within this sector. Some brands that you may have heard of already, um, the one that's, that's been around for by far the longest is the brand Corn, a UK-based company using mycoprotein. Um, but as you'll see in the next several slides, most of the activity in fermentation as it relates to alternative proteins has really happened in the last five years and much of that in only the last 18 months. So this is really a, a fast emerging sector here. So first let's define what we're talking about when we use this term fermentation, because this word is actually used quite differently across different technical disciplines. What we're saying when we use this term is the cultivation of any microbial species. And that's whether you're trying to harvest the, the whole cell biomass at the end of that cultivation process, or if these microbes are simply a means to an end of purifying some particular valuable component that these cells are manufacturing as a, a sort of host production platform. Now this process, the, the notion of using microbes as a production platform, is pretty well established. There's been decades of activity leveraging this, this exact idea, and I'll give a few examples that are quite tangible, but applying this technology to specifically the developments in the alternative protein sector is where we've seen a lot of this newer activity. Fermentation, as I noted, has a very long history within the food industry. 
Um, you may know the term fermentation most colloquial, colloquially as, you know, the act of using microbes to literally ferment in a biological sense, uh, things like, like malt barley or grapes into alcohol, al alcoholic products, um, or using microbes in uh, the act of making fermented foods like kimchi or certain sausages. Uh, so those are, are historically quite somewhat old-fashioned uses, one could say. But there's also been a long history of use of microbial fermentation in more sort of biotechnology relevant applications in the food industry. Most specifically, it's been used to make uh, a whole suite of enzymes that are used in both food processing and in other industrial processes like the paper milling industry and so forth. One of the, the most um, sort of obvious examples and one of the most striking from the perspective of rate of adoption by the food industry has been using fermentation to make the enzymes that are used in cheese production. So prior to the early 1980s, cheese production relied on enzymes that were derived literally from the stomachs of calves. Um, the same enzymes that essentially curdle milk upon ingestion are causing that same curdling and coagulation in cheese production. Uh, after the, the early 1980s, when these same enzymes were able to be manufactured in uh, a microbial host, either a yeast-based host or a bacterial host, uh, and manufactured at much larger scales, much higher purity, and much lower cost, this new production platform for those enzymes was rapidly adopted by the food industry. And today, virtually all of modern cheese production uses these fermentation-derived enzymes. Fermentation is also used to produce a lot of other kind of smaller additives that go into both human food and animal feed um, that may not be quite as obvious from the consumer perspective. One of the largest scale fermentation industries in the world is the manufacture of specific amino acids that are supplemented into animal feeds um, to improve you know, weight gain and uh, feed conversion ratios. What I've shown there in the photo on the bottom right is one of these massive manufacturing facilities for an amino acid called lysine. Um, so this happens to be a plant in South Korea, but these are all over the world, um, quite a few of them actually in India as well. Uh, and this is, is massive scale fermentation um, going almost entirely into animal feed. As I noted, fermentation has already disrupted many industries, and when it does, when this technology becomes available, typically this disruption happens very fast on the course of a few years to get upwards of 80% adoption in the industry. These are a few examples you'll see in the, the orange line there is the rennet, that cheese coagulating enzyme that I mentioned before. Uh, but also examples like vitamins, um, riboflavin, one of the B vitamins. You can see how quickly uh, that immediately became the entirety of the riboflavin market was fermentation-derived um, riboflavin. Same with some uh, medicinal products or therapeutics. So insulin is another example that many folks are familiar with. Um, again, this used to be derived from animal sources from essentially, you know, organ byproducts from animal slaughter uh, and is now produced cleanly and the actual human version rather than a sometimes allergenic animal version um, produced through fermentation. So you can see this has been happening historically for simpler types of products, some of these individual enzymes or proteins or small molecules like vitamins. And what we're moving into now is a realm of using fermentation to produce more sophisticated types of products. So products like meat analog products, where you're actually using texture and kind of the whole mass of the, the microbial biomass, um, or more sophisticated proteins and functional ingredients that can, again, bolster the activity going on in the plant-based realm, as well as in the cultivated meat sector.
There are a lot of advantages with the fermentation platform from the perspective of launching a new product category, scaling it quickly, and getting rapid adoption in the market. So as we've touched on multiple times, this is a relatively mature technology and the scales at which this is occurring are massive. 600,000 liters is not an uncommon size for some of those fermenters for things like uh, amino acids that go into animal feed. So really massive scales and there's kind of proven de-risking uh, scaling tools to move from, from small scale bench validation through to scale up um, and ultimately to these, these massive scales. It's also relatively low cost. So some of the things that fermentation has been used to displace are things that historically would have come from um, very high volume, low margin types of industries like the petrochemical industry or the animal feed industry. So you know that this, this platform must be capable of achieving very low price points in order to displace those types of products. Third, there's a tremendous amount of diversity to tap into when using fermentation. So you can tap into diversity in terms of the actual species of the organism that you're cultivating. Um, there are, are millions and millions of organisms that haven't even been explored for their use in these types of industrial or food applications, uh, as well as the diversity of different molecules that these organisms can produce. Next, this is, as I mentioned, familiar to the food industry, which presents a, a huge advantage when it comes to regulatory approval because fermentation has been used to make so many of these food enzymes and vitamins and ingredients for such a long time. There's really well established um, sort of comfort levels with food safety and with certain key kind of workhorse strains uh, that are used regularly. Um, and these types of, of applications are approved by regulatory agencies around the world. There's also a very fast R&D cycle and production cycle, which both kind of relate to the same fundamental aspect of microorganisms, which is that they grow really quickly. If you're looking at something like a, a plant, a crop in the field, your growing cycle is typically on the order of a whole season or a few months. Uh, for you to sort of see your crop come all the way to fruition to know whether, you know, the new cultivar you, you grew that year actually performs better than the year before. Uh, even for something like animal cells in cultivated meat, um, that doubling time is, is typically on the order of a day or more than 24 hours. Whereas these microbes, whether you're talking about fungi or algae or bacteria, typically have very short doubling times. They can be less than an hour or more typically in the span of a few hours. So that accelerates your R&D. You're able to much more quickly see um, sort of the, the impact of any strain selection or modifications that you're making. Um, and it also, of course, gives you very fast production cycles. Your volumetric productivity is very high. You're basically able to uh, harvest a batch of your process every few hours to every few days, depending on your bioprocess design. So all of these are, are tremendous advantages, of course, to fermentation. And because of all of these, it really, as I mentioned, is emerging now as a critical enabling platform for the alternative protein sector. So these fermentation facilities can generate biomass that, that is able to serve as a standalone protein source. We'll call this biomass fermentation, and I'll break these out a little bit more um, in the next slide or two. But it can also be used for these higher value ingredients, or I call them enablers, for plant-based products and for cultivated meat products. When looking at the roles that fermentation can serve across alternative proteins, it, it can be hard to segment them because they really cross a lot of these, these borders. But I'll outline three sort of main buckets that I think most microbial fermentation product categories fall within. The first is what we call traditional fermentation. So this is the, the notion of basically using microorganisms as biological tools to process some sort of raw material or feedstock um, or bioconvert that material. 
So you're giving these microorganisms some sort of input material in almost all cases that are relevant here, that will be plant-derived ingredients. And then those microorganisms are modulating or converting those ingredients. Um, for example, by, by spitting out enzymes on those ingredients um, and changing their functional properties, um, producing you know, a bouquet of, of flavoring molecules and other kind of sensory enhancers and so forth. So examples in that category, again, are the products that are most familiar to, to folks. So alcoholic beverages would be a conversion of sugars into alcohol, uh, cheese and, and yogurts and things of the like are um, again, conversions of a lot of the sugars in those products in the, the original milk um, into some of the more complex flavors associated there. Uh, even something like tempeh where you're using say a soybean feedstock and then growing um, a, a, a filamentous fungus on that feedstock uh, is an example of traditional fermentation. You're getting a different flavor profile, you're getting higher bioavailability of some of those nutrients um, because that feedstock's being essentially partially digested by the fungus. The next category is what we call biomass fermentation. So this is where you intend to use basically the whole mass of the microorganism itself or some functional fraction of that mass. So maybe you're only interested in say uh, a protein isolate or an enriched protein fraction. Maybe you're mostly interested in some of the fats that the, these microorganisms are producing um, such as omega-3s from algae. So this biomass fermentation um, really, the, the product is the, the biomass of the organism that you're growing rather than some combination of feedstock and organism. And then precision fermentation is a, a newer term um, that, that really describes the use of microorganisms as production hosts. So if there's some very specific ingredient that you're trying to derive through um, through this biological production platform that you'll ultimately purify away from the host cell. The host cell is, is not what you're after in this case. You're just using the host cell as a mini factory uh, to produce something like an enzyme or a flavoring or a pigment um, or those amino acid or vitamin examples that I gave before. So these are, are kind of the big categories that I'll, I'll talk about as we move forward. Um, but just note that the boundaries between these are, are not crystal clear. There's, there's a lot of examples of products and companies that sort of blur the lines between these or that have a suite of products that touch on multiple categories here. So I'll start with traditional fermentation. And what I wanna talk about is, is how this concept is really kind of moving beyond these historical use cases to develop solutions specific to the alternative protein sector. So the company I'll highlight here is a company called Mycotechnology uh, based in Colorado in the US. They're using um, the fermentation of, of shiitake mushroom, so a, a common food uh, ingredient already uh, to basically functionalize or improve the, the taste and the texture um, of plant proteins like rice protein. Um, so they've actually partnered now with one of the world's largest meat companies, JBS, to launch a new branded product line um, under a, a brand called Ozo. Um, and this, this product line is plant-based meat products that use this uh, functionalized plant protein um, where the sensory properties were improved by fermenting that protein with shiitake mushroom mycelium. For biomass fermentation, there are quite a few new companies in this space. Um, again, corn is kind of the historical example of biomass fermentation, and, and it was really kind of unchallenged in the field for for decades, frankly, um, but we're starting to see a new crop of companies pop up that are really leveraging, uh, in many cases, the sort of innate structure of particularly a lot of these filamentous fungi. 
Um, so many of these species grow with these, these filaments that essentially are similar to something like a muscle fiber. Um, so they have that sort of innate texture and uh, kind of water holding capacity or moisture um, and fibrousness, aligned fibers. Um, so you can get that texture without some of the downstream processing that's required for a lot of plant-based meat products where you might have to use something like high moisture extrusion to get that fiber alignment. So here's two examples, again, US-based companies um, that are using biomass fermentation to derive uh, product, products um, and products for consumers. So meaty foods, you can see there, uh, uh, kind of steak mimic and then a chicken mimic and then at last food co um, with a bacon prototype there. And then precision fermentation, as I mentioned, can really serve to address key functional and sensory challenges in plant-based products and cultivated meat products. So I'll just touch on a few examples here. The first is Clara Foods making egg white proteins, which then could go into any number of culinary applications. Uh, Perfect Day making milk proteins. They've actually just launched a commercial ice cream product in partnership with another brand. Um, so they are, are starting to actually make their way onto the consumer market. Geltor is making collagen proteins, which are the primary constituent of gelatin. And they're actually entering the market in sort of higher value, lower volume applications like cosmetics um, or, or the, the R&D industry that actually use collagen um, at very high purity, which Geltor is able to do um, with the intent of essentially moving down the price point gradients uh, as they get to larger and larger scales. So it's important to keep in mind that food is, is actually related to other bio industries as well, and we should look for opportunities across all of these. Triton Algae Innovations is an algae company making non-GM heme proteins. Um, so this is sort of a, an answer to uh, folks who are interested in the, the sensory capabilities of heme proteins as demonstrated by companies like Impossible Foods, um, but maybe are looking towards markets that aren't as receptive to uh, genetically modified sources for those ingredients. And then Richcore actually is an Indian company um, that makes growth factors. They're one of the world's largest suppliers of growth factors to virtually every company making cell culture media for animal cell culture. Um, so this obviously has relevance to the cultivated meat sector. Um, they are exploring making things like food grade growth factors rather than pharma grade, which historically has been what the whole market is there um, for biomedical applications. Um, so there's tremendous potential to bring down some of those price points and therefore make something like cultivated meat um, much more economically viable. Now I'll talk a bit about the investment landscape and sort of the, the vast amount of startup growth that we've seen. So in 2019, through the first half of this year, so the last 18 months, um, what we've seen is that investment into fermentation companies specifically focused on alternative proteins has been about half of the VC investment into all plant-based alternative protein companies. Um, so that's quite a substantial sort of uptick in the amount of awareness and interest and investment opportunities in this space. You can see all of these um, stacked bars for total investment into the three pillars here with fermentation in orange, plant-based in the darker green, and then cultivated meat um, you can see as a, a smaller wedge of the pie in the light green below. And particularly, this has picked up, as, as noted in the last slide, in the last 18 months. So even in the first half of 2020, so the, the last six, six to seven months, we've already seen more than the total capital invested in all of 2019 going into fermentation companies for alternative proteins. Um, it, a large part of that has been a couple of, of really big deals, for example, into Perfect Day, 
Um, so that it's been actually a smaller deal count, but a larger dollar number. But again, we're only halfway through the year here and we expect to see a lot more activity in this space um, throughout the rest of, of 2020. And about 80% of all of the fermentation companies specifically focused on alternative protein applications have formed in the last five years. So you can see the orange line there is the, the total of all companies. And then the green bars are how many companies were founded in each of those years and in the first half of 2020. And you can see we're, we're on a steady increase here um, with new companies being formed um, you know, virtually every month at this, at this point. So all of the companies on the right hand of this slide, um, with the exception of corn, have been founded in the last five years. What we're seeing as well is not just an increase in activity of startup companies, but also more interest in alternative protein solutions from the big established players who are already in the alternative, or excuse me, in the fermentation industry. So some of these massive companies like DuPont and Denisco, Novozymes, DSM, um, several others in this realm have been developing sort of tailored solutions or tailored portfolios for alternative protein companies to be able to tap into. In some cases, this is new lines of actual cultures, um, for example, um, for things like dairy, um, cheese and, and yogurt cultures, live cultures that are specifically optimized for use with plant-based feedstocks rather than dairy feedstocks. In some cases, this is portfolios of enzymes that can help improve the functionality of plant-based ingredients, um, really kind of giving these product developers toolkits um, to address some of the challenges that have been um, kind of inherent in using plant-based proteins, things like solubility or off flavors or things like that. Um, a lot of these companies are, are developing these solutions and really seeing this as a key opportunity area. Now I want to touch on algae as well because a lot of the companies that I've mentioned so far in this presentation have been using fungi, um, either some form of yeast or filamentous fungi. Um, so there's been a lot of activity there, but there's also, I think, huge potential in algae. Um, particularly microalgae, which you can grow essentially in the same types of fermentation platforms, um, or you can grow them outdoors in these sort of open ponds, as you see in the photo here, in which case you're using photosynthesis and you've obviously got that sustainability benefit. Um, so that's ultimately where the algae industry, you know, wants to go and, and where they can get the best sustainability and productivity. Um, but in the short term, you can also grow algae in essentially the same way you would grow something like a yeast or a bacterium. Now, algae are already used um, to produce ingredients in a lot of food products that you're already eating and that are kind of key to the alternative protein industry. One good example of that is um, as a source of binders and thickeners and gelling agents. So you may recognize ingredients like carrageenan or alginate um, being used in things like plant-based dairy products and so forth. The other area where these types of ingredients might be useful is as uh, scaffolding materials for cultivated meat. So when you're growing animal cells into meat-like structures, you need some sort of a 3D environment for those cells to adhere to and to help sort of guide their spatial arrangement. And those scaffolds are um, often made of these types of what are called hydrogels, um, which are essentially these gelling agents. Um, and actually alginate has been used in the tissue engineering field as a, a source of scaffolding for quite some time. Algae can also be used, again, in the same way that something like a fungi, a fungus can, um, as a source of bulk protein. So just expanding the number of, of protein sources available uh, for plant-based products or potentially to blend with cultivated meat um, for hybrid products. 
Algae are already used um, a fair amount for things like pigments and flavoring agents, um, ingredients like carotenoids, I mentioned before the heme proteins, um, can be used in plant-based meat um, as ways of, of coloring uh, the meat tissue or providing flavor, or these can be sort of nutritional inputs for something like cultivated meat, um, particularly something like cultivated seafood, I think is, is where algae have a, a real chance to kind of stand out. Um, if you think about, you know, conventional seafood, the feedstock, so to speak, for fish and sea creatures is in many cases algae. That's what's at, at sort of the base of the food pyramid. Um, so those same ingredients and molecules um, that are ultimately making their way into fish tissue um, often originate from the algae. And one example of that is actually in the, the omega-3 fatty acids that we really prize from seafood products. Uh, specifically DHA and EPA as two of those omega-3 fatty acids. Um, these are uh, actually inherently made by many algae. Many of the, the fish that contain omega-3s um, are simply bioaccumulating them from the algae that they consume. Um, and algae-derived omega-3 fatty acids are already used in several plant-based seafood products. They impart that sort of fishy smell as well as that nutritional claim. Um, and these may in fact be required if you want to have that same fatty content in something like cultivated seafood. So I'd like to delve into some of the key opportunity areas from a technology perspective for innovation across fermentation for alternative proteins. Here's a very sort of high level schematic of the value chain of fermentation just so we can highlight some of the key areas for innovation. So at the very upstream, you've got feedstock optimization. That's essentially your, your nutrient source for the microbe that you're growing. Um, there's a lot to optimize there. As with humans, you know, your performance will really depend on what you're eating. Uh, the same is true for, for these microorganisms. And obviously the feedstock as the primary input for this process uh, has a lot of implications for things like sustainability and overall cost of production. This is also um, in this upstream portion where it's relevant to think about strain development. What species are you growing? What strain of that species? Have you adapted that strain, for example, to do particularly well on a given feedstock that you're interested in using? Um, has that strain been uh, engineered or edited to produce some sort of high value ingredient that it wouldn't um, naturally. Uh, so a lot of room for improvement at the strain level um, with or without uh, tools like genetic engineering. There's a lot that can be done in strain development simply through selecting strains that have certain properties that are beneficial throughout the, the process. Then once you've landed on your ideal feedstock um, formulation and your ideal strain, then you go into the bioprocess. So this is the act of cultivating the cells and then ultimately harvesting them. Um, cells can be grown in a, a closed contained environment um, in a, a bioreactor. That's by far the most common uh, form of fermentation is, is what's called submerged fermentation where you've got your cells in this liquid feedstock inside a closed bioreactor. But you can also do uh, solid state fermentation or open fermentation where your feedstock is um, maybe something like, uh, like wood chips or some other agricultural byproduct. Um, and you're simply growing the, the cells essentially on that feedstock and then you can harvest them off the top of it. Um, so there are pros and cons to, to both of those types of processes. And then once you've harvested your biomass, then you may have some level of downstream purification or enrichment or fractionation, uh, depending which type of product you're making. So if you're using traditional fermentation and you want to keep that, you know, partially digested, so to speak, feedstock as part of your final product, um, then you would harvest the entirety of the process, the feedstock and whatever cells come along for the ride. Uh, 
uh, if you're just harvesting the microbial biomass, then you'd typically want to filter out the cells from that, that feedstock, whether it's liquid or solid. And then if you're using these cells as a production factory and you just want some very specific high purity functional ingredient that those cells were producing, then you'll typically have a more intensive downstream purification process uh, to get that ingredient, whether it's an enzyme or a protein or um, you know, some other vitamin or amino acid, something like that, where you need that high purity and you don't want any of the sort of residual host cell to come along for the process. And across each of these steps, there are tons of room for, for optimization and troubleshooting and, and so forth um, to really improve the efficiency of this process and to expand the diversity of products and ingredients that you're able to make. So I'd like to touch on these five areas for, um, for technology development and innovation. And I'll give a few snapshots of specific innovators or companies that are touching on one or multiple of these, because I think it's, it's easiest to sort of highlight the room for innovation by, um, by pointing out companies that have, have done it quite cleverly. So the first item here is target identification and selection. What that means is, is really only relevant to precision fermentation, where you're using these microbes as a host platform to make some specific high value ingredient. So the question of what's that ingredient that you're trying to make um, is this question of target identification. W what sort of ingredients would you be able to add to other products that would really add value? And what's, what's the biological pathway for a microbial organism to be able to make that ingredient? Strain development um, is, in some cases, selection of the right species or adapting that species once you have sort of your, uh, your starting candidate um, to be much more efficient, much more productive, um, in some cases to express your target at much higher levels. There are a number of ways that you can optimize that strain to be um, particularly um, efficient for your specific process and your specific end product target. Feedstock optimization, as we touched on, could be leveraging something like a waste stream or a side stream um, that is abundant and cheap um, to, to make it suitable as a, a nutrient source for your microbe. Um, or it could be simply optimizing the mix among existing um, inputs to the process, something like, like sugars that are used routinely in fermentation. The process design and manufacturing includes all steps of essentially scaling up your, your seed train once you've got your strain development um, completed, all the way through to your large scale production, whether that's in opened um, submerged fermentation or, uh, excuse me, closed submerged fermentation or open solid state fermentation, and then the harvesting as well and downstream purification if needed all fall within process design and manufacturing. And then as with all alternative protein products, um, if you're making an actual end product that would be sold B to C fashion to an end consumer, then you might have a step of formulation and product development. What other ingredients are you adding to your product um, to get the right flavor profile? Um, are you doing any sort of processing in that final formulation step that would improve the texture, for instance? So all of these are areas for innovation. So let's explore five different companies that are focusing on slightly different parts of, of this whole equation. The first company that I want to highlight here is a company called Motif. Uh, they actually are spin out of Ginkgo Bioworks, which is one of the first and probably one of the most well-known synthetic biology companies. And Ginkgo Bioworks was really built around this notion of a biofoundry, having sort of a library of many different strains, many different biological production pathways um, that a, a product developer can kind of pick and choose what type of molecule they're trying to make and how they want to make it. 
and and work within this this database essentially of, of strains and products to figure out the best organism for the job essentially um, so there's a lot of leveraging of sort of high throughput screening technologies um, and and you know digital tools and so forth to be able to sort through a massive amount of data uh, and very quickly iterate to a solution for making a specific high value product. Um, many of the, the sort of historical uses of this type of platform or paradigm were in the biomedical field, uh, but Motif spun out of Ginkgo Bioworks, recognizing that there's actually a whole sort of realm of solutions specifically for alternative proteins that can leverage this bio, biofoundry platform. So they're really focusing on target identification. What are the things that we want to make that we think would be game changers for, um, for example, for flavoring ingredients in uh, the alternative protein sector, in the plant-based sector, um, and then optimizing strains to produce those, those game changers. The next company I'll highlight is a fascinating one. It's called Nature's Find, um, and it was started in Montana here in the US um, at a, a research lab just outside of Yellowstone National Park, uh, which you may know as um, a park with a lot of geyser activity, a lot of um, kind of hot springs and these really fascinating pool formations that you can see in this kind of brilliant blue and orange photo here. Um, these hot springs that have, um, in, may, in many cases, very abnormal pH and very abnormal temperature, sort of extreme environments, select for a whole bunch of organisms that thrive under those conditions. So those colors there are actually in part generated by the microorganisms that live in these hot spring pools. So um, there was a research group that was basically exploring the organisms that live in these extreme environments um, for, for cool sort of functionality um, and just to learn more about extreme biology. And there was one organism that came from those studies that um, presented itself as potentially a candidate for food production, um, which you can kind of surmise or intuit why that would be attractive to a product developer. This is an organism or, or to a manufacturer. This is an organism that's intended to grow in an environment that almost nothing else grows in. So from a contamination perspective, from a kind of large scale um, bioproduction perspective, this can be really attractive. Um, the other innovation um, that Nature's Find is tapping into is uh, really in rethinking the process design. So rather than having capital intensive closed bioreactors with a lot of stainless steel, um, really kind of built out infrastructure and facilities, they're able to grow this strain essentially on what's almost like a cafeteria tray. So you can see in that photo on the bottom, that's the founder of Nature's Find folding up a, a mat of this, um, this fungal strain that they've grown on the tray there that just contains a very simple medium um, and is able to grow out in the open with no protection like that without contamination, um, as I mentioned. So really kind of upending how capital intensive a fermentation production facility needs to be. Can it, can it be just a series of trays, you know, stacked vertically instead of a, a large scale intensive <clears throat> uh, bioreactor facility? The next company I'll highlight that I'd mentioned prior to this um, is Triton Algae Innovations that's using a, an algae strain, as their name suggests, um, to produce heme proteins for potential flavoring ingredients in plant-based meat products. Um, and they're actually working with an algae that naturally makes heme proteins. And they've done quite a bit of strain development to select for strains of that algae that produce very high levels of these heme proteins. And what you can see in those small scale benchtop bioreactors there is um, that algae being grown essentially in a, a closed fermentation environment, expressing so much heme protein that it's actually not green like you would expect an algae to be, but is actually red 
Um, and then uh, there's also innovations around, you know, how exactly that growth is done to be able to select for those high uh, expression levels of heme proteins. Um, and of course, there's downstream purification to just get that, that heme protein um, isolated in ingredient form uh, in a way that's, that's not overly um, cost prohibit prohibitive. Next, I'll highlight a company called 3F Bio from the UK. They are rethinking both process design and feedstocks that go into um, fermentation processes. So this company actually uses the same microorganism that the company Corn uses, um, but they're rethinking where these manufacturing um, facilities are located and their, their model here is to actually co-locate a microbial fermentation facility next to a bioethanol facility where you've got feed grains coming in, you're fermenting those feed grains into ethanol, which goes into fuel, and then you've got some leftover fraction of that input feedstock that's not being converted to ethanol that can then go into your, your mycoprotein uh, fermenter as its primary feedstock um, and vice versa for any feedstock that doesn't get uh, consumed by your mycoprotein organism. So you're reducing the amount of waste coming out of the process, you're reducing the need for new feedstocks coming in, you're just using the feedstocks that, that are left over from bioethanol refinery um, and getting a high value protein product out of this. So this, I think, is a great example, again, of kind of widening our sphere um, to look beyond just the food industry and say, how can these types of companies interface with other aspects of the bioeconomy, whether that's in fuel or industrial chemistry um, or a number of different areas. And then the last snapshot I'll do here just to pull in some, some formulation and product development. Uh, is Perfect Day, which is, again, the company using a yeast platform to produce dairy proteins. So part of their um, early R&D, quite a, a large part, was really identifying within dairy, you've got dozens or maybe even hundreds of proteins present, which are the ones that we should focus on to get the specific functional properties, the mouthfeel, the creaminess, et cetera, of dairy, protein, of dairy products, um, because we don't want to make all of those dozens or hundreds of proteins. We need to be really targeted and say, which ones are doing the heaviest lift here? And can we just make that set of a few proteins and get 95% you know, of the way there from a functional perspective? Um, and then once they've got that, that kind of protein list refined, then they plugged into a pretty well-established um, species of host cell um, and are actually partnering, partnering with other fermentation companies to do their scale up and manufacturing. Um, so they're able to, you know, tap into existing expertise in that regard. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, they're partnering now with um, a brand that's commercializing their first products. So they have a few ice cream partnerships underway um, that are actually getting these out onto the market. Um, I had it for the first time a few weeks ago, and it was, it was delicious. It was phenomenal. So again, just to bring us back to the whole picture here of, um, of all of these aspects of the value chain, as noted, even though ferment fermentation is relatively mature as a platform for producing things in food and beyond, there really is a ton of room for continued innovation and investment at every single one of these process steps. So I'll leave you with a few key takeaways um, and then just highlight a couple of upcoming resources, uh, both from my team in the US and then Varun's got some exciting resources and events on the horizon as well. So key takeaways, fermentation can contribute to alternative proteins across all of the, the modes that we discussed as a source of primary biomass, as a means of converting other plant-based ingredients to improve their functionality through traditional fermentation, and as a host platform for some of these higher value ingredients that can really enable um, innovations in both plant-based and cultivated meat.
while there's been a lot of excitement and attention in the last few years um, into fermentation and its role in alternative proteins, there's still a ton of room here. Um, and I'll just flag this to say there's, there's tremendous room, especially to focus specifically on emerging markets. Um, a lot of this activity from an innovation perspective um, has been in the US and in Europe, um, but markets like, uh, like Asia and like India have tremendous fermentation capacity. There, there are co-manufacturing facilities for a lot of these global fermentation companies um, that could really be tremendous assets to companies that, that start in um, those regions of the world. And then we talked about specific notable areas for innovation all throughout the value chain, all the way from feedstock and host strain development through the bioprocess design and finally to final product formulation. So I'll, I'll just mention that in the next week or so, later this month, we will be launching our very first state of the industry report for fermentation. Um, you may have seen our, our team puts out these state of the industry reports each year for the last couple of years. And um, historically, we've just done one for the plant-based sector and one for the cultivated meat sector. Uh, but this year, we are adding one for fermentation in recognition of its role as this, this key third pillar of the alternative protein industry. Um, if you'd like to be on the list to receive that when it launches in the next week, um, you can sign up there at gfi.org slash industry. Um, and I'll hand it back to Varun to talk about um, some of these upcoming events. Are you on here, Varun? Thank you so much, Liz. I think Varun's just uh, switching on to his camera. Um, Great. So I'll, I'll just quickly cover a poll that I ran. And I think about 70% of attendees found the content very, very relevant. And, you know, almost 50% of the attendees found 80% uh, of the content new. So that was a great thing to note. And uh, most of them have heard about the Smart Protein Summit, almost 98% are very excited and have already registered or planning to register for the uh, you know smart protein summit that is from 6th to 10th of october so uh, a great session varun would you like to continue so sorry i had a bit of a connection issue but yes um, we're very excited to, to host the summit this year it's it's virtual of course we're calling it the smart protein summit because uh, as we've called it the future of protein summit in previous years we think that future is now uh, firmly within our, within our grasp uh, so we're calling it the Smart Protein Summit. Um, you can go ahead and register at smartproteinsummit.com. Please excuse my dog playing with her squeaky toy in the background. Uh, and I also wanted to highlight that we are, in fact, uh, unveiling an analysis that we've done in the GFI India team on algal proteins and their application within the alternative protein sphere, which is very exciting. We've been doing this. Uh, we have a research fellow and our science and technology specialists have been doing this for about uh, several months now. Uh, we've spoken to global experts, we've spoken to Indian companies in the algae space, and we've highlighted some opportunities to intervene in the algae value chain that could create um, lucrative uh, business opportunities, as well as uh, kind of cutting edge research as well in the space. So we look forward to hosting everyone at the summit. Uh, we're thinking of it as very much uh, sort of two tracks. There will be educational materials that will be shared in advance and resources that will be shared in advance. And then the actual sessions of the summit will be uh, we'll we'll focus on articulating our vision for the next decade of the next food the next food system in India. Thank you, Shardul. Excellent. Thanks, Varun. So I will um, I guess stop sharing my screen. Hopefully, everyone knows knows our website and our our uh, social media handles there. Please do engage with us. Um, I'll stop share and we can open it up for questions. Thanks, everyone, for your attention on a Friday night. Awesome. So we can get started with questions and um, Liz and Varun, you can take a look at the Q&A section for some of the questions that have been coming in. Um, so uh, Liz, I think one question talks about bioreactor and how, uh, you know, people or stakeholders uh, invested in that uh, part of the value chain. How can they think better about uh, fermented meat or cultivated meat, uh, especially fermentation meat? Yeah, so for meat products, there are really two ways that um, you could use fermentation. So one would be simply 
harvesting um, the, the fermentation, sorry, the, the cell biomass, in which case you could use sort of a traditional bioreactor system in which you've just got single cells kind of floating around in the medium, um, and then you harvest those cells, and then you may have to have some sort of downstream step to structure or process those cells to get sort of the fiber formation of meat. Um, so there are some companies exploring, for example, using extrusion of um, fermentation sourced proteins um, for meat products. However, there are also ways to get that meat-like structure without, um, without much downstream processing that do require a little bit different um, bioreactor setup. So one example would be these companies like Meaty and Nature's Find and um, Atlas Foods that are just growing the microbial biomass as essentially sheets where that fiber formation is kind of inherent in there. Um, so that's a very different bioreactor setup, but, but kind of lends itself well to structured products. Um, and then there are some cases where it's sort of a, a combination of both. Um, so if, take a company like Corn. Um, you can, actually can find quite a bit of detail on their production processes because they've, they've been around so long and actually have published quite a bit in academic journals um, on their process. But they use what's called an airlift fermentation process. So rather than having a big stainless steel reactor with, say, a stirring impeller in the middle that's keeping everything suspended and mixed, um, they actually use airflow to kind of bubble up and cycle through their reactor. Um, so that's one way they've been, been able to get um, larger scales and to be able to do this sort of submerged mixing fermentation with fungal strains that, that want to form these sort of fibrous um, filamentous networks uh, that can end up being quite viscous and don't always work well with an impeller system. Um, so once they harvest their biomass, they actually then have an additional step that's basically a sort of a freeze thaw step. And they use ice crystal formation to kind of bundle those filaments into things that look more like fibers, look at a, a microscopic level actually like muscle tissue. Um, and so they're, they're able to use this kind of mixed liquid fermentation, but then one additional fairly low tech downstream step um, to get more of that, that fiber formation for a meat product. Got it. Uh, thank you so much for that excellent insight. Um, I think the next question is as fermentation processes in general are governed by microbes and thus cannot guarantee uh, similar quality and quantity. And there are also chances for uh, cross contamination uh, throughout the process. So um, what are some key um, things to keep in mind while designing the own entire process and scaling it up uh, in terms of a critical control point or hazard perspective? Yeah, yeah, that's, I'm glad to hear you use that kind of nomenclature of critical control points, hazard analysis, um, the, the methods for uh, addressing, proactively addressing cross-contamination risk are the same as, as have been really established and, um, and, and pioneered by the fermentation industry up till now. Um, in, in some cases, you know, there actually are kind of allowable levels of, of relatively benign contaminants for certain processes um, if your, your process is running for a short enough period of time so that they don't become, you know, too abundant in the population. Um, a lot of food production processes actually are not sterile. They're, they're simply, you know, validated as safe. So you show that there's, there's no kind of level of, of um, pathogenic contamination above some allowable threshold that's been set by regulators. Um, and that's true across all products, actually, not just fermentation, um, any food product that you have, there are thresholds for any of these levels of contaminants. Um, having said that, if you're working with a novel microbe that might have particularly a, a slower doubling time, um, so maybe it's, it's more on the order of, you know, several hours rather than just a, a, an hour or a couple of hours. That leaves more room for other adventitious microbes to come in and, and kind of take over the culture. So in those cases, you might need a slightly more kind of capital intensive bioreactor system where you've got much tighter kind of closed containment controls 
um, and are, are monitoring constantly to, to make sure that you'll be alerted immediately if some sort of contamination event does occur uh, and so forth. And then the other potential strategy to deal with contamination, um, as I highlighted with Nature's Find, is to, to find microorganisms that either grow in really unusual or extreme environments where there just really are few other organisms that could come contaminate, or that grow on unconventional feedstocks. Um, so most microorganisms that might want to come contaminate your culture would do great on something like a sugar feedstock or, you know, an easy carbon source like that. But there are some companies um, that are using interesting bacteria or, or fungi um, like methanotropic bacteria, for instance, that, that eat methane um, and very few organisms are able to, to leverage that carbon source. And so they, they've got sort of inherently a, an advantage when it comes to keeping unwanted bugs out. Got it. And I think uh, the next question kind of ties up a little into this, but maybe you can add a little more insight. Uh, what kind of protein or peptide allergen measures are undertaken by uh, alternate protein platform companies specifically currently? Allergenicity testing, is that, did I hear you correctly? Yes. Yeah, to prevent so it, some measures to, you know, make sure that uh, protein or peptide allergens are, you know, not contaminating it. Yeah, so whenever you're working with a, a new um, ingredient source or protein source, um, there will be allergenicity assays required, I, I think, in most jurisdictions. I'm not a, a regulatory expert, so I don't want to overspeak here. Um, but typically, that's a, a, a sort of standard aspect of the process of introducing a new ingredient. Um, there are quite a few uh, so-called in silico um, allergenicity assessment tools that exist now. So rather than um, having to do something like an animal trial or, um, or even a cell culture based assay to see if you're triggering any kind of allergic response, um, you can often use some of these computational methods to look for uh, proteins in this new ingredient source that might trigger um, uh, an allergenic response. There are sort of these classic uh, so-called epitopes or structural signatures on proteins that tend to cause allergenicity. Um, so that will certainly be part of, of the process for approving any new food ingredient. Um, and it's, it's not trivial to go through those steps of getting a new ingredient in, approved. I think that's, that's why we've seen a lot of the companies using the same um, sort of well-validated, established strains that have been used in uh, the food and enzyme industry for quite some time is because they just, you know, they don't want to add that additional regulatory hurdle to um, all of the other innovation that, that they're uh, focused on. Um, but I think there's, there's really room to branch out into new strains and so forth. Got it. Um, next question is from Laura. It's about bioreactors. And uh, she asks if bioreactors used for fermentation are the same ones uh, that are used in cellular agriculture. And if yes, are you concerned about the fermentation capacity available worldwide, given how many cell lag and fermentation startups are planning to outsource this function as they scale up? Yeah, this is a great question. So an infrastructure question. So um, there are, I'll segment into three types of sort of bioreactor facilities at present. Um, and caveat this by saying that there may be opportunities to retrofit or adapt facilities from one of these categories into another category. Um, but still more work to be done to kind of validate how much that would cost, how feasible is it, etc. Um, so the first are facilities for, for cellular agriculture, I assume the question here is around um, for cultivated meat, so animal cell culture. Um, the facilities that currently exist for animal cell culture are currently almost all serving essentially biopharma or therapeutics clients. Um, so they have quite a bit of infrastructure overhead um, just because all of the, the kind of regulatory burdens and sterility burdens and so forth are different for medical grade products than for food products. Um, but it's conceivable that some of those facilities, you know, if they were decommissioned from, from biologics production um, could be used for something like cultivated meat production. Um, those are pretty different um, from the types of bioreactors used for microbial fermentation. 
Um, the, the animal cell culture processes typically require a much greater degree of control over several aspects, you know, temperature mixing, um, gas, dissolvable oxygen and gas penetration um, and all of that. So they're, they're much more capital intensive bioreactors. Um, which makes sense, you know, animal cells are used to being in a highly regulated environment in an animal's body where you've got, you know, very narrow kind of tolerance bands of all of those conditions. Whereas microbial cells are used to being free living in the environment wherever they can find a food source. So they're much more robust. Um, they're much more uh, kind of tolerant of, of not having quite as precise control. Um, and so the infrastructure tends to look fairly different for microbial fermentation. Um, you still have, you know, sensors and you're still able to adjust those types of, of manufacturing parameters and so forth. Um, but there's not quite the, the same level of stringency there. Um, so for, for uh, processes like um, uh, enzyme production and amino acid production and things like that, where you're, you know, producing specific um, specific end products from fermentation, those types of facilities would likely be um, pretty amenable to, to being used by companies that are, are doing fermentation for these alternative protein applications. Um, the other area of microbial fermentation facilities um, is essentially the, all the bioethanol facilities, of which there's a lot of capacity. There are, are millions and millions of liters of capacity of bioethanol fermentation um, around the world. It's not quite as clear how easy it would be to convert a bioethanol fermentation facility to one for microbial fermentation for food products. Um, and the main reason for that is that bioethanol fermentation um, is, is typically anaerobic, whereas most of these uh, fermentation processes we've been talking about today are aerobic. They require oxygen to be, to be present and mixed in. Um, that's not true across the board, and there are some companies kind of testing whether we could just change the organisms we're working with to be able to leverage that existing ethanol fermentation capacity. Um, there's one, one company called Brood Foods um, that's, that's exploring precisely that. Um, and if that is a, a source of infrastructure that we'd be able to tap into, then that really opens up the amount of existing global capacity. Um, so I'm very interested in, in sort of how some of these early ex explorations of that potential turn out. Varun, would you like to throw in some light here on the Indian capacity? Yeah, I just wanted to add that. Um, so Liz's point earlier about retrofitting or, um, or even accessing perhaps manufacturing facilities that exist in industries like amino acid fermentation, et cetera, uh, is an excellent one. I think that overall, when it comes to the Indian ecosystem, one of the things that we're seeing at GFI India is we see huge promise in countries like India. It could be East Asia, South Korea, China, of course, but also India uh, in retrofitting pre-existing biopharmaceutical um, capacity. But also we think that a lot of this is going to have to be greenfield production. So a lot of it is going to have to be um, companies like, let's say the Serum Institute of India, which are widely celebrated within vaccine manufacturing. And uh, a key piece of vaccine manufacturing does involve fermentation. Uh, there will need to be the installation of new manufacturing capacity within our sector uh, because we won't be able to address the scale up of our sector purely with what's out there. Uh, as Liz said, a lot of this capacity is already constrained or it's, let's say, they're over capacity with the needs uh, that currently exist in the marketplace. And especially with COVID-19, I think over the next years, if we do have a coronavirus vaccine, a lot of that capacity will be taken up by that. But what these companies do have, and there's many of them, right? The Serum Institute of India, Biocon, there's so many pharmaceutical companies in India and, and all across Asia now um, that could address these problems. What they do have is the knowledge, um, the institutional investment in all of these areas that, as Liz mentioned, have to adhere within biopharma to higher degrees of safety, to higher regulatory burdens. This, the, the GMP, and the critical control points and the hazard analysis, et cetera, within, uh, within biopharma are of a higher standard, generally in terms of regulatory burden than would exist for food. And so what they could do is they could repurpose not just their existing infrastructure, but their existing institutional knowledge and their talent pools towards some of these areas. You're seeing this with cultivated meat companies, as Liz said, 
um, some companies like Aleph Farms are already signing uh, deals with major food companies and with major uh, pharmaceutical companies all over the world in order to essentially do things like give them licenses for their markets. So they would take the, the technology uh, of cell culture from Aleph Farms and then help scale it up with their institutional knowledge. So there, I think there's a lot of work to do in this area, but uh, this is a very promising avenue, especially within India to focus on. Thank you so much for, for that perspective. I think Liz, the next question, and by the way, uh, just a side note, we are running something called the Smart Protein Innovation Challenge training, um, which trained about more than 1,000 uh, you know, students, early stage researchers, early stage entrepreneurs under the age of 28 uh, about the alternative protein sector. And one of the participants from the challenge is also one of our attendees today, and she asks, uh, can you give some insights on how receptive would the target audience be to try a probiotic edible skin or you know, fermentation-derived edible skin? Uh, as an alternative to meat, uh, like, you know, kombucha mother cultures as bacon or uh, scoby as an edible skin for sausages or skin wraps for plant-based fried chicken wings. Um, so uh, any, any views on uh, this kind of uh, innovative idea? This is a fascinating idea. I love this. I mean, I, mean, I think a lot of, um, certainly a lot of, of microbes grow as what's called a biofilm um, that can have a, a really kind of durable texture, very much like a, you know, a chicken skin or a sausage casing or something like that. Um, I'm not aware of any companies using a sort of microbial mat or biofilm for those types of skin applications. I think it's a fascinating idea. Yeah, because they rapidly grow and the costs are relatively less and they're being underutilized right now. So it seems like a good idea at Prima PC value. Thank you so much for your perspective. There. It, is, uh, but, it is also yeah. a side stream. It's a side stream from something else. So you could utilize one of the, you know, I mean, it has a, it has a product, which is kombucha or whatever, and then you, and then you utilize some of it for this. So it's quite an, uh, quite an interesting circular product. Yeah, I know there's been some work in that regard um, in the materials and kind of textiles and fashion industry. Um, there's a, it's quite old at this point, but you may be able to find it a TED talk of someone who takes uh, basically kombucha scobies, I think, um, and kind of tans them like you would a leather hide and has like a, a fake leather jacket out of it. Um, so it certainly, you know, has been explored for non-conventional uses, but I'm not aware of anyone using that in alternative proteins. I love it. Got it. Thank you so much for that perspective. Um, could you throw some lights on the approximate or very tentative cost for setting up a fermentation plant for, you know, extracting enzymes? Um, or in general, throw some lights on economics of setting up um, some of these, uh, uh, you know, greenfield facilities. That is a great question that I wish I had deeper answers to. Um, I, re I really would be like speculating to throw out a number there. And, and obviously, it's highly dependent on the scale and the downstream processes. Um, typically for some of these high purity products like enzymes, um, often kind of a rule of thumb is that the, uh, the downstream processing accounts for at least 50% of the overall manufacturing cost. Um, so there's really a pretty wide range here. And even within, um, within recombinant proteins or within ferment, precision fermentation. So I'll just address one other question I saw here in the chat. Um, recombinant proteins is essentially the, the same concept that we're talking about with uh, precision fermentation. Precision fermentation is a, a term that I believe was coined um, by the think tank Rethink X in a report they came out with last year, but I've now seen it um, used by quite a few um, uh, innovators in this field. Um, so recombinant proteins are obviously making a specific protein of interest. Precision fermentation can range a little bit wider. So beyond proteins, is there you know, a secondary metabolite or a specific lipid or something like that? Um, but the same concept of using the, the cell as the production host. Um, so within recombinant proteins in particular, which are kind of the, the most well-established um, kind of form of precision fermentation, um, there's up to like a nine orders of magnitude difference in the, the retail price point of those proteins um, by virtue of things like scale of production, level of regulatory stringency. So are we talking about, you know, a, a protein that's used in a vaccine or a therapeutic, or are we talking about, you know, an enzyme in uh, industrial chemistry? 
Um, so, it, you know, nine orders of magnitude difference means there's, there's quite a bit of variability um, in what these facilities actually look like. Sorry, I don't have a better answer there. <laughs> I think that I think that makes a lot of sense and I think next question and we have time for maybe two questions now we are kind of getting towards the end of our webinar um, so um, uh, Dinesh asks how easy or hard it might be to uh, might, it, it might be for working with companies that already have large-scale fermentation setups in food feed healthcare to produce high-value ingredients like heme uh, would there be any potential opportunities like these worth exploring currently how um, saturated or unsaturated the space is yeah, I think there's definitely opportunity for those larger established companies to get more involved than they currently are. Um, you know, I think a lot of the, the maybe um, delay in not being early movers in this space is simply because they're looking at the volume of the current market relative to their existing clients who, again, are often these massive clients in things like animal feed or industrial processing. Um, and so they may be watching the alternative protein sector with a great de degree of interest, but not necessarily moving just yet. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that we'll see a lot more activity in this direction in the very near future. Um, but there's also quite a few of those larger established fermentation companies that are kind of outsourcing innovation in the more traditional paradigm of um, starting corporate venture arms and then investing in early stage startups that are doing cool things in fermentation with an eye towards um, eventually either developing a joint venture with them or potentially acquiring them outright. One example of collaboration in this area is the, the company Nutrico, which is a Dutch maker of, of, uh, of animal feed and amino acids for animal feed. And they've partnered with Finless Foods and Blue Nalu, excuse me, Mosa Meats and Blue Nalu. Mosa Meats being a company that makes cultivated beef and then Blue Nalu being a company that makes cultivated finned fish, fish. So I think that's already happening to a certain degree. It's happening in the form of these strategic partnerships as we talked about earlier. Yeah, another great example would be um, the joint venture between ADM, which is one of the largest fermentation and also um, grain and crop processing companies, uh, with Perfect Day. So they're able to tap into um, not just existing infrastructure, but also that operational expertise that comes with having scaled processes in fermentation um, to these massive quantities over and over, which is tremendously valuable. Got it. I think we have one last set of questions and I'll club a little bit of uh, those two, three questions. And uh, they're basically talking about uh, precision fermentation or, you know, the use of uh, GMO, uh, genetically modified organisms in this process uh, and how can it really impact or mislead the category and are there any regulatory concerns around that? What just, do you want to add? Wanna... Yeah. yeah I... Muted myself. Okay. There we go. All right. GMO in food is, of course, not permitted uh, in India. And so this is an evolving landscape uh, within India. Uh, the way that the technology works is that you're modifying uh, a microorganism to give you an end product. And what you want is that end product, right? Typically with precision fermentation, what you want is that end product. And so you're actually, as Liz mentioned earlier in her excellent presentation, you're actually filtering out the, the, the organism itself, right? So there may be certain small trace amounts of the organism in the final product, but um, it's not in a, at a, it, it usually is below permissible level. So we're seeing, for example, in the US perfect day, which Liz has mentioned, um, is, is, by the way, Indian founders who are working on beta lactoglobulin, uh, which is a protein found in milk. Um, and they, they manufacture it using precision fermentation methods, recombinant protein methods. Um, they have received uh, no objection letter from, from the US FDA. So no questions asked, no objections to go to market. Uh, whether that would translate the same to the Indian market is, you know, I think it's an evolving question. Um, and I think time will tell. I think we're going to see more companies come up in this space in India as well. And I'll also just note, you know, there are examples of having both routes available where you can use a GM process, a genetic engineering process, or look for a strain that produces either an identical molecule to what you ultimately want or one that's similar enough to do the job. So again, that, that heme protein example, um, I think is a, a clever one. Um, you know, impossible foods approach was to 
take the, the gene for soy leg hemoglobin, basically the soy version of a heme protein, um, and put that into yeast um, for, for large scale production. Um, so that's a genetic engineering step to create that yeast strain. But a company like Triton is, just went and found an algae that produces fairly high levels of heme proteins and continued essentially just breeding and selecting for new strains of that species to have higher and higher levels of heme proteins. Um, so for many of these functional uh, proteins or functional ingredients, we may be able to, you know, cast a wider net across the microbial community and say, can we find some, some, you know, existing kind of natural product uh, that meets these specifications or is close enough that it'll do the job. So there's always multiple ways to attack these, these challenges. Maybe this is a great time for me to say, uh, if you're interested in these kinds of companies, maybe you want to register for the Smart Protein Summit during the Innovators Showcase this year, we do have a company that's taking a similar approach, uh, sort of bioprospecting for uh, strains of algae, in fact, that, that naturally express these um, these molecules of interest, these proteins of interest. Uh, so yeah, I think I think you're going to really enjoy that. Awesome. So we are almost at the end, and we've uh, overshoot by five minutes, but I think that's okay. A uh, bunch of insightful questions coming in all around, and I think we've had a great session. I'll just remind all the attendees to uh, take a look at the document in the chat box if you want to join the GF Ideas India community. Um, we are a, a 450 plus uh, strong member community now in India with all uh, a lot of key stakeholders from the alternative uh, protein space who are all focused on a common mission. So there's a lot of transaction happening uh, between all of them, a lot of networking happening between them. And we look to accelerate a lot of this uh, during our Smart Protein Summit as well. So please take a look at our website, register for a lot of different sessions. And we look forward to having you with us uh, you know, during 6th to 10th October. Great. Uh, having said that, uh, thank you so much, Liz, for taking the time out and joining us this early and um, for this wonderful presentation. I'm, I'm sure that everybody is going to find it really useful. We are going to obviously circulate this recording with a lot of attendees. And uh, once again, thank you so much, Varun and Liz, for taking the time out, for being with us today. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Liz. Bye. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. And have a great weekend.